Hi, and welcome to Hot Topics. My name is Asia Thomas. I'm the Director of Organizing here at Open New York. And this is Hot Topics where we get to talk about anything and everything that's in the pro-housing universe. So today's Hot Topic is pro is um, parking minimums. And we have a group of expert, amazing people who are here today that are gonna talk about this. And I am going to let them, um, also I should add that um, Hot Topics is hosted by Open New York. And so right now we're gonna let our guests here introduce themselves and then we'll get right into our topic of parking minimums. And so we'll start with Sarah. Uh, hey, my name is Sarah Lind. I am, I am a member of Open New York, but I'm also here as a director of policy at Open Plans. Uh, we are an organization in the livable streets movement working to make our public space, streets and sidewalks safe, livable and equitable. Awesome. Welcome, and Will. Uh, and I'm Will Thomas. I'm the executive director of Open New York. Uh, we're, uh, if you haven't heard of us, we're the organization uh, working to end the housing shortage in New York City. Uh, we fight for housing in uh, high opportunity, transit rich, uh, you know, neighborhoods that have historically underbuilt. And we're looking to uh, get uh, New York City and New York State all the housing that we need. Thank you, Will. Logan. Hi, my name is Logan Ferris. I'm the political director at Open New York. We have Samir. I'm Samir, I'm a member and, and lead in Open New York. Um, if you hop on the Slack, you'll see me in all, all the different channels, just being social and having a good time. I am also a member of Community Board 5 um, and uh, in Manhattan, and I do a lot of uh, transportation advocacy as well for safe streets. And Bobby. Hey, my name is Bobby Barnett. I am a longtime member of Open New York as well as a member leader. In the past, I have uh, worked as an affordable housing professional here in New York City and continue to advocate on behalf of my community as a member of Manhattan Community Board 4 and through my other uh, personal projects. Awesome. Well, welcome, everyone. This is a great conversation I have with a great group of people. So we're just going to get started. So Open Plans, Open New York. Uh, the mission of both organizations is so that um, New Yorkers can have a more sustainable, more equitable living, basically, right? Um, how does parking minimums fit into that? And anyone from Sarah, Will, Logan, anyone fit into that? Yeah, Sarah, would you want to start by explaining how your uh, how Open Plans sees yeah. uh, parking minimums? Yeah, sure. So yeah, I mean, we definitely um, see the intersection of housing and streets as making, you know, our city livable. Um, so we're super excited to be working with Open New York on this issue because I think it's both a housing and a streets issue. Um, so for us, you know, as a, as a group focused on livability, um, you know, parking minimums, uh, which if anyone doesn't know, it's uh, uh, part of the zoning code requiring new development to include a minimum number of parking spaces, um, often, you know, one for every unit, say, or a commercial development might have to have a certain number of parking spaces for, you know, their customers. Um, and so when we have parking minimums, it encourages people to own and drive cars around the city. You know, if you're moving into a building and the building says, yeah, there's a parking spot for you. It's like an easy, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll bring my car then. Um, and I guess when I need to go to the store, I'll drive there um, versus, you know, a, a while ago in Manhattan, the Manhattan core uh, south of about 110th, they got rid of parking minimums. You know, my building doesn't have any parking and, I love not having a car here, you know, uh, because, and then, you know, I, I, there's transit and, you know, I, I take the train and I take the bus and I walk around my neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, we can create more livable neighborhoods when more people don't own cars. Um, and we know, obviously with the, with the climate crisis, you know, we need fewer people to be owning and driving cars around their neighborhood. Um, so just creating safe streets and livable neighborhoods, and then the way that it connects to housing, I think is so important as well. So I'll let, you know, either Logan or Will take over on that aspect of the policy. Yeah, I, I'm happy to, you know, Logan, if, if either you or Bobby have anything you'd like to add, feel free to jump in. But I, I, uh, I think that people don't always see parking as also a housing issue. Uh, many times, one of the most uh, 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 
you know, a, a large driver of construction costs and it's something that makes it a lot uh, more expensive to build new housing is including uh, off street parking. Uh, usually they have to, uh, you know, an underground garage can cost something up to $50,000 per, wow. uh, per unit, which adds a lot to, uh, you know, the, the cost of, of construction. And it also means that you know, if there's a marginal project that, you know, may go through, it, it may have been built if it didn't have parking, but with parking, it would be too expensive to build. Uh, because those projects aren't built, that means that on, uh, you know, there, the, the uh, housing shortage that we have is just worsened by um, the, the uh, you know, units that could have been built that are not currently, uh, you know, uh, being built. So we think it's it's both a way to ensure that more housing is constructed, but also that the, the housing that is constructed is more affordable uh, for uh, uh, New Yorkers. Uh, Logan, Bobby, I don't know if you have any, anything you'd like to add. Um, the only thing I want to add is just uh, thinking about this also in a way that you know, we know that COVID has been especially difficult on local businesses. Um, we see this as also a way to stimulate economic growth um, and economic, economic development in, um, in neighborhoods. And, you know, parking minimums can require, um, you know, maybe a ground floor garage that then uh, takes away space that could be used for retail. Um, and, you know, makes those cities less walkable because retail is then spaced out and further away. And so, um, you know, allowing those opportunities to have, you know, grocery store around your block or maybe in your building um, instead of the, the parking space that, um, you know, most New Yorkers don't have cars. So, um, you know, that that all New Yorkers can take advantage of, we think is really important. I'll just jump on that um, and say, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It's like, well, you have to have a parking lot because you need people to be able to drive their cars to the grocery store. But the reason why they have to drive their car to the grocery store is because there's parking lots for every store. And so the neighborhood is really spread far apart. And so you can't easily walk. So if we want to create walkable neighborhoods, we have to start by, you know, just taking taking out these parking lots. That's a great um, point, Sarah. Actually, there was a few amazing points. I, I know a lot of New Yorkers didn't realize the amount that it costs for per unit to add in parking. So that was a really good um, gem that I think New Yorkers will take with them. And then again, um, just giving that visual of how parking lots add to a, a neighborhood block really does make it non-walkable. So thank you again for sharing those gems. So we're gonna go to our next question. And um, what exactly are the mandatory um, parking minimums? I know it started way back when, but what, what is some history there that you guys can give a, a quick synopsis on? Anyone can take Sarah, Bobby, anyone can take this. Um, Logan. If Will, if you have an answer, I'm happy to. No, I, I, all, I, all I would say is that they were adopted alongside the, the zoning code in, in uh, 1961. Uh, in 1961, New York adopted a, a uh, among other things, a far more restrictive uh, zoning code than it had in the past. Uh, and one element of that uh, was to include uh, uh, these parking mandates. Uh, there was a lot of fear that New York City was losing out to the suburbs that, that uh, the uh, that that the suburbs were the, the the way of the future that everyone would drive places that you know if New York City didn't have parking that you know New York City would lose out. Um, I think you know nowadays uh, you see I would say much more desire to be in the city than in the suburbs, um, but the the uh, rules haven't quite caught up with that. So you know we have this suburban zoning code. When we really should have one that's geared towards our own needs. That's yeah, awesome. just to add on to that, there are places like in New York City that don't have mandatory parking minimums, the locks in Manhattan, for example. Um, and that's been great for, for us who live in Manhattan. But you know, there are other neighborhoods and other boroughs that are rapidly urbanizing. They have like a not a lot of new uh, tall buildings due to recent rezonings that allow you know more people to live there. And it would also make sense to 
um, extend these getting rid of the parking minimums to those areas. And if we're going to do it, then just, you know, really looking at it across the board and seeing that, look, it doesn't make sense to force developers to add parking when people don't want it. And it's not going to limit the parking. You know, if they, it's a nice people say like, oh, but what about far in the Bronx? Or what about deep in Queens? And no one's stopping you from adding parking if you want. We're just saying you don't have to. Great point. That's a great point. Or Staten Island. <laughs> but Bobby, did you have anything that you wanted to add, to add there? Yeah, um, sure. Um, yeah, one piece I wanted to add. Oh no, I've forgotten everything. No, 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 I'll get sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so we'll go on to our next question uh, really quickly. How do um, we think that these park minimums, I know we've spoken about it already, but if we can just go into a, a tiny bit more in depth into it, um, Bobby or Samir, how do we think that um, park and minimums actually affect everyday New Yorkers? So I think there are two kind of key ways that I think are particularly um, worthwhile talking about, uh, both in rents themselves and the way that parking are cap is capitalized into rents. So we've seen studies from throughout the country, and um, there have been dozens over the past several decades that have talked about how uh, the costs of development are capitalized into rents. And I've seen numbers that range anywhere from like 10 to 30% um, increase in rents. And so we may not be able to, you know, say what that would mean for a one particular project, but what we can almost definitively say is that rents are higher because we are paying or subsidizing the space that we allocate to cars. Um, and then I think a second key one, and one that I imagine we'll all have a lot to say about, is the environmental effects of inducing demand for vehicles. Most research that um, on parking minimums suggests that it does encourage people to own cars. There's not a ton of evidence that supports uh, the contrary, though there's some. Um, and so I think that most of us here would largely agree that, you know, we're inducing demand when we're creating parking spots. And when cars drive, there are a ton of negative externalities to this. A uh, key one is noting that areas in New York City adjacent to highways have manifold higher rates of childhood asthma and other respiratory and cardiovascular complications. And this affects, in particular, children. But Emerging research that we're seeing on pollution shows that it really affects everybody, including adults in lifespans. You know, um, next to Central Park are going to be higher than they will uh, next to the BQE. And that's incredibly unfortunate. We're all kind of paying for that as a city. Wow, that's a good point. Thank you, Bobby. Um, uh, one, one thing that I might add to that is just to, uh, in, in the importance of, of uh, clean air, is that the 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 reason why Manhattan uh, doesn't have parking minimums is actually in reaction to the Clean Air Act. Uh, the the air quality was so bad in Manhattan that uh, you know the city, in a way to clean up its air to to meet those requirements, uh, you know adopted uh, you know uh, you know or rather abolished uh, parking minimums uh, below uh, uh, 96th Street and. Uh, uh, on the east side, and you know, 100 uh, was 115 on the west side. So the the uh, uh, the um, in terms of uh, encouraging clean air, and and you know, that is probably something that that should be extended to the other boroughs as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, um, Samir, you want to add on? Um. Yeah, I think sometimes it's nice to put like hard numbers to these types of things. So like when we talk about housing costs, or not even just housing costs, but like, you know, retail costs, like, you know, if you're a low margin business, say a grocery store, having that space for um, groceries or, you know, fresh food or anything else is, could be, you know, make, make more money and make the business even feasible in the first place. It might not exist. Um, but sometimes you think of a car and you're like, okay, how much space does a car actually take? And you can like have a mental model say, I don't know, like this big or whatever. But like when you include all the space you need for maneuvering, all the space you need for sanding, it's really like 300 square feet per parking spot. And the average apartment in Manhattan is 702 square feet. So for every two parking spots, we can have one more home. 
And I think just like thinking about it that way is really powerful. So if you have 100 units and uh, let's say it's, you need one parking spot per unit, it could have been 150 units if you didn't have parking. Wow. And you know, those numbers really add up. Yeah, they do. They do. Wow. Thanks for, um, for the, again, that visual. I think it's really hard for New Yorkers to envision what what is actually the the issue and then now we want to talk about what we think is the solution so really helping new yorkers to paint that picture for new yorkers on what you believe are the solutions to having a more sustainable more equitable living that includes um um you know this conversation of parking minimums um so we'll start with you sarah yeah sure so we are super excited to be um following the lead of several cities who have already done this. And I know New York doesn't like to be a follower, so we need to get back in the lead um, of just eliminating parking minimums entirely. Uh, you know, right now, as you know, Will mentioned, we've talked a little bit about some parts of Manhattan don't have them anymore, Long Island City, there's still a few kind of like, oh, if it's near a train station and it's got a X number of affordable housing, maybe it doesn't have to provide parking. Um, it's really complicated. It's kind of onerous for you know, developers to comply with. It makes it harder to build affordable housing. Um, so you know, we think let's just get rid of the entire rule, uh, leave it up to the market. As uh, Samir mentioned earlier, we're not saying you can't build parking. If it's a you know new building in an area where there's not a lot of access to transit, maybe they will still build parking. That's fine. Um, but just get rid of this outdated, you know, onerous government mandate and allow the market to work. Um, and we think from conversations that most development won't have parking because they don't want to be doing this. It's not, it's not good for housing affordability. It's not good for the environment. Um, so, you know, if we just get rid of this outdated mandate, uh, we think it'll solve a lot of these problems. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, Will, Logan, anything to add? Uh, well, I, I would just clarify the kinds of places, uh, you know, that that uh, have eliminated these uh, parking requirements, uh, you know, like there are, uh, you know, other cities, you know, uh, San Francisco, for example, has eliminated these, but also cities like Minneapolis and Buffalo and in, in New York. So it, when we're, we're uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not even in the leader in New York State on this issue in a sense. So it, it would be really great to, uh, to get back in, in, uh, into the driver's seat, so to speak. Well, maybe I shouldn't use that phrase. Awesome. Um, and just and just noting that like New York City has the best transit in the country. Like we have the best transit system. Um, and these other cities that have managed to eliminate them and see really positive impacts don't have the kind of transit than, that we have. So like what what is our excuse um, if these other cities are able to do to do it and we should be able to as well. And for people who are concerned about what this looks like in New York City, um, under our current parking minimums regime, we've added exceptions for affordable and affordable senior housing in much of the city. Those uh, developments have gone up uh, without a hitch. It's not been an issue to not require that they contain parking, and it's enabled developers to offer a more affordable rent to the people who are living there to be able to build and have the subsidy um, go further and serve more people. So I think there's a lot of promise there. Yeah, I, I would add as well, you know, we see this as a part of a holistic approach to, you know, a livable city. And that does include expanding access to transit for sure. Um, and of course, you know, building new subway lines is time consuming and difficult and expensive. Um, but expanding access to bus, you know, with dedicated bus lanes, rapid transit, um, bus rapid transit, uh, you know, is something that the city can do itself right now if they have the political will. Um, so even something that we might see as a transit desert right now uh, doesn't have to be. It's it, We can get access to transit really quickly if we're willing to do it. Um, and, you know, so, so limiting uh, the lack of parking minimums to kind of transit rich areas is really short sighted because we can make the whole city transit rich if we want to. Um, and, and frankly, we have to, again, for, for the climate crisis that we're facing, we just, we have to do this um, and then we have to do it now. Thank you. I could not agree more. Um, before we go on to our um, last question, Samir, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? 
didn't want to leave you out of that part of the conference. <laughs> um, no, I think I think everyone else said it pretty well. Awesome. I just awesome. had one thing I wanted to add in that. Um, just going off of Sarah's point is that a lot of times, um, you know, creating those opportunities for public transit is at odds with having cars on the street. So like you need, we see that bus lanes are like, don't have political power. <laughs> we can't, it's, we don't have the political power to get bus lanes because there are too many cars on the street and, you know, folks don't want to take away a lane for that. So, you know, we have to eliminate cars in order to create those opportunities um, to expand public transit to transit deserts. So I just wanted to kind of tie that into Sarah's point. And, and include bikes as a public form of transportation. I mean, there's so many times where you have to fight with cars or fight with a bus in order to get where you're going in New York City. So uh, per, yeah, there's a lot of New Yorkers who will, that would definitely resonate with. Okay, so our last question, this is a big one. This is the one that we bring it all home and we allow New Yorkers to really understand where, where we're coming from with this. What's possible right now? What is possible? What, who are our elected officials that we can get New Yorkers to advocate to? Who, what can New Yorkers do to speak out? What's possible right now? Yes. Uh, Go ahead, Will. First. <laughs> All right. I, I mean, I think that the most, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the person I think you should contact first would be your local council member. I think, you know, the, the, uh, the council will ultimately need to vote on a, uh, you know, uh, uh, any sort of, a text amendment that would, uh, you know, change uh, these rules around parking. So it's important that your council member know from you and early that you know you support, uh, you know, changing these rules for lower rents and a more, you know, livable environment. Uh, the mayor also will need to, uh, you know, move on this. So you know, you can contact the mayor's office as well. Uh, although, um, you know, I, uh, I, I would do both and and. Uh, Sarah, I don't know if you have. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. You know, and, and I would just say, look, people who um, right now have cars in the city and feel like they need to have those cars for whatever reason, um, they have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo and in fact, in adding more parking. And so because they have a vested interest that they see as under threat, they are very vocal, um, you know, even progressive council members say like it's it can be they hear from those people a lot and that it can wear them down on standing up for issues they care about so they need to hear from us as much or more um you know and it's harder for us to organize because we're we're looking for a new world we're looking for something new we're not protecting an interest we already have but we have to get people out there contacting council members all the time um it's so important and also you know uh eventually this would go before every community board. So um, get used to now showing up at your community board. That's important anyway, for many reasons. Um, and join your community board if you can uh, apply. It's too late this year, but it's so important. Um, I think in the next couple of years, we have some real opportunities with term limits coming onto community boards to get new people on community boards. And we need like everyone watching this video to apply for your community board, to show up at every meeting, to make your voice heard. For sure, that's and awesome. Yep. I just wanna add a kind of like a note about the fact that there's momentum here. Um, you know, Mayor Adams released his strategic plan and mentioned rethinking parking requirements. So this isn't out of the blue. This isn't um, something new to electeds, um, but we know that we have to push them to do it. Um, so going back to uh, Will and Sarah talking about reaching out to your council members, your council members have relationships with the administration. So, um, you know, if, if you push them to also speak with the administration, about um, getting this ball rolling, um, you know, I think that that's really important and a really important first step. Yeah, I can add one additional thing to Sarah's community board plug. Um, most community boards offer public memberships to their various committees, and I am sure that you can contact the chair of your local board and inquire about the transportation committee. Having people who do not drive and don't have that lived experience, who take transit, who walk, who bike, 
and do other things is incredibly important. And, you know, while on my community word, it winds up working out. So we have plenty of folks like that. That's not true everywhere. And typically drivers are overrepresented. So any additional color that you're able to add to your own local situation would be incredibly valuable. I think one, one more thing to add. Um, I feel like sometimes people uh, don't remember this one. It's very important. You got to vote. You got to vote every time there's an election. Sure. These We're talking about city council members. They are elected. We help elect them. Um, so make sure you vote, even if it's for you know state office. They will also have, um, they can use their bully pulpit. They can talk to people. They can push for these things. Um, it's very important to vote, convince your friends to vote. It's a uh, great public service that we need to do every single time we get the opportunity. And a proof of concept of voting. I remember during the primary talking to Mark Levine about how to make sure that we get more pedestrians and cyclists onto community boards. And then I saw a question that came out with the application. It's when politicians are willing to have a conversation about this, they're willing to move. And um, it's clear that uh, seniors call out, it makes it clearly makes a difference. That's awesome. Well, this was a great conversation. I'm pretty sure New Yorkers have been well informed. And I want to thank you all for being here and for really sharing your thoughts and really getting this conversation going. This has been amazing. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much. If you want to learn more about Open New York and what we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter at Open New York, on Instagram. You can also visit us at our website where you have more information there. And we also have Open Plans and you can follow them as well. Is, um, is it Open Plans? Yeah, uh, our Twitter is um, Open Plans NYC, I think. Uh, no, our Twitter is just Open Plans and our Instagram is Open Plans NYC. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And you, I will tell you, you can visit Open New York's website at openneyork.city. Okay. Uh, so more information there. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>